unanonymously that we will continue um, with, with these webinars. Um, today is the second time and it's uh, CJR folks who will present now. I have to say that I'm uh, not fully uh, sure if we will have one presenter or several. Um, but I would invite uh, Indu uh, to probably start right now. Do we need to? Catherine, did, did I forget forget anything? No, that's okay. Go ahead. So if you want to share uh, your screen and go ahead, please do so. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Uh, hello everyone, good afternoon or good morning wherever you are. Uh, so today we are focusing on water inclusive water governance in Bangladesh. So but to talk more on that we have uh, today we have four different speakers uh, as Oli pointed out before. So from diverse different work packages of AMD project. So the, the presentation will be started by Dr. Morani Sarkar from IRI. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Ad Ahmed Salauddin. And then, and then I'll be coming in uh, to briefly talk about water issues. And then that will be followed by our partner, Trosa Afsan Project. Um, so I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Morani Sarkar to briefly start with the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hi, good morning, good evening. This is Mo from ED. So today we'll be talking on inclusive water governance in Bangladesh Delta Food System. Um, so we'll be covered uh, three key issues in this presentation. So first one is uh, what we did for 2022 on work package four in Bangladesh on policies and institutional analysis and primary research. The second issue we'll discuss is the centrality of water governance in the South Coastal Delta region. And finally, we will provide a glimpse of how we are working toward the work package four uh, at the end of uh, initiative outcomes, uh, where our focus will be on the partnership and impact. So as you know that uh, Bangladesh uh, is a kind of climate vulnerable country and 80% of Bangladesh topography are flood plains. It's highly vulnerable to climate change, and we are also facing large and growing populations, dynamic changes in demography and, and developments. So Bangladesh is experiencing everything that Asian mega delta wants to address. So it is the kind of perfect or imperfect delta challenge, uh, challenge locations. And there is a real need to shift more inclusive, resilient food production systems. A lot of actors are engaged in exploring solutions. How can MD leverage on this intervention? So we'll be looking at these issues. So our work package four on the gender equitable inclusive deltic food systems. We have revised our theory of change, which is has now already approved. Feel free to review this. And our focus will be on partnerships and impacts, how we can influence uh, policies and choose of Food governance and gender and social inclusion. Here is a glimpse of what we did uh, in 2022. We did a baseline analysis. We contacted uh, three consultants and one local partners from uh, policy and academic background. The NGO here is CNRS. This NGO has been working on the issue of inclusive food system governance, including uh, in the south uh, coastal regions. And Dr. Asadur Jaman, one of our consultant, he has been working on the uh, governance issue for a long time. Actually, one of the first comprehensive review on governance in Bangladesh is written by him. So our focus was on the analyzing the key policies with a focus on the governance and gender inclusion, gender and social inclusion, and then complementing this analysis with a case study research. We have just submitted three deliverables from our package four, research report, policy brief, and published one journal article. So we did a very in-depth review of the following policies, as you can see, and also some other policies we found. And we found that um, very interesting findings, and some of the uh, findings are kind of insistent policy reforms across sectors. So 
if you look at this policy, you will find that Bangladesh livestock and fisheries policy have been have not been like revised for quite some time. It is very old still. And there are also fragmentation of policies because of lack of sectoral coordination. There are financial and capacity challenges. Actually, there are more insights uh, and I cannot discuss here for the lack of time. So what does inclusive governance means and how to measure this in relation to policies? So uh, for this, our first attempt was to establish a framework to review the inclusive governance through a detailed review of literature. Through a, a review of uh, context and very specific literatures, we identified the seven dimensions to assess the inclusive governance. Uh, let me give you some examples of what uh, our finding shows. But in this screen, the left side shows our uh, seven dimensions. So regarding the uh, presentation and participation, we know that Bangladesh has really good policies and most of the policies make uh, references to marginal farmers and women as a specific um, uh, target groups and beneficiaries and also ensure their participation in the implementation of projects and programs. However, um, there is a lack of information on how these groups are involved in the planning or decision making process or, or how uh, these um, interventions are reshaping for unequal gender norms and practices and cultures. For capacity and skills, um, a recent meeting we a recent meeting uh, organized by Bangladesh Agriculture Research Council, uh, it was highlighted that uh, that the single most pressing challenge in Bangladesh is the gap between research policy and extensions. And our work package four will work on uh, BRC and other organizations to unpick these challenges and explore the ways forward. In terms of access to natural resources, market systems, technology, finance, it is not equal for all small holders uh, or, for the, or for the more marginal groups like landless women. Some policies, for example, a national agric uh, agricultural extension policy recognize these challenges, but there is a still lack of consistency in addressing this on the ground. So uh, all of the investment projects in uh, agriculture food system, they provisions for the credit, you know, credit and financial support uh, to marginal groups. Um, our fisheries policy calls for compensating the fishermen for banned periods by uh, cash or in kind. Uh, we also have a gender budgeting that have been practiced for uh, quite some years in Bangladesh. However, uh, there is hardly any information in the financial support received. We are receiving it timely or is it enough for them? or the spent uh, the, the spending purpose or is or that is given to them or whether the poor men and women receive you know, such support or not for the knowledge systems uh, we observe there's the policies technology interventions are you know mostly top down uh, for example uh, in the national agricultural policy 2018 they identified that it is a key challenges for bangladesh but uh, still it is unclear how this approach to be realized or internalized in, in practice. For innovations, uh, different projects introduce many technology for farmers. However, in practice, the acceptance and utilization constrained by many factors. One of the factors could be the financial support, traditional cultural norms, mobility, etc. So uh, we also use the same uh, seven criteria and undertake a gender and social inclusion analysis of the above mentioned eight policies. I am not going through this because of lack of time. However, uh, for uh, for the JC framework, uh, there will be three categories from gender blind to uh, gender transformative. So when uh, a policy will be given no attention to gender, uh, that means score is zero according to CGI gender impact assessment, then that policy will be gender blind. When uh, gender will be uh, gender integrative, when there will be score one and gender transformative for score two. And uh, this, uh, this work is still uh, you know, under progress. Uh, so it's kind of a messy uh, uh, slides, but just uh, I'll give it a bit of brief. So we also got some very excellent findings from our case studies in the fields in Shatkhira. And one of the key points is uh, the honor of policy directiveness. Uh, so national stream policy opted for coastal land use zoning to resolve the conflict between the shrimp and rice farmers in the in that area. However, uh, it's been like eight years, but uh, still there is no sign of such land zoning. And the other finding is that we also know that women have significant contribution in food systems. 
policies incorporate the gender focused farming practices, but often it does not translate into action in the fields. So there are also political bias, elite captures of the water resources. So we had a field visit in May and all work packages uh, agreed that water is the key challenges in the polar area. And we have to really work on the water management issues. So to talk about more about this, I would really like to call Dr. Salahuddin. Dr. Salahuddin, over to you. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So if we look at the history of water management in Bangladesh, we can, uh, in broad uh, term, we can divide it into three different phases. Uh, we could talk about pre-1960s when uh, there was the effort of constructing coastal embankment projects from the phase of uh, uh, farmer managed water management, uh, in little uh, localized infrastructure. So uh, that after 1960s, it was really the big uh, investment on coastal embankments, which was primarily managed by the uh, government. But uh, after 1970s, mid 1970s, up to uh, before 2000, actually there are a lot of small scale flood control and water management projects were constructed. And in that period, actually, the all this most of the small pole dates were constructed. Uh, and altogether, we have about 139 boulders uh, in the country, most of them are small scale. And these are, at, at this period of time, projects like early implementation, early implementation projects or system rehabilitation project, they uh, introduced this concept of people's participation in planning and managing projects. But it was after 1990s that was more institutionalized uh, under uh, different projects called uh, IPSAM or Blue Gold projects, uh, where they worked uh, more on the people's participation. And um, also, uh, you know, developed uh, different rules and regulations which support this kind of people's participatory water management. Uh, uh, you know, uh, institutional approaches. But uh, if we uh, uh, would like to evaluate those uh, status, then we would find actually these are more, you know, uh, uh, not related to the actual functioning of the administrations. It is uh, quite remote from um, actual uh, political uh, institutions. So these are uh, water management uh, institutions, but work quite uh, remotely from the real local government institutions, uh, which was not the intention. So next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, during the last one year, uh, we were, you know, having some joint visits and we also uh, started doing some uh, real activity in, in our selected folders under AMD. In, in those processes, uh, in those experiences, we found some of these uh, findings uh, and observations. So water management, uh, identified as the priority issue in any natural resource management interventions, coastal areas by all this. Uh, you know, in all meetings uh, so far we attended, it was identified as the number one issue that need, needs to be addressed if we want to make a breakthrough in agriculture or uh, in natural man, uh, resource management activities, uh, research and development activities. 
and uh, most even in the base folders we'll find that there are uh, conflicts and, and, and there are issues that needs to be addressed and existing water management organizations uh, they um, they admitted that they can alone cannot actually solve those problems they need uh, something more to you know assist them to be able to address those issues and uh, uh, officially uh, organizations such as water development board is the in is the authority but uh, they are still removed uh, from the real issues uh, at the local level and non farm interest groups is still uh, they are controlling the major uh, water structures and they decide actually when uh, uh, this uh, particular structure will be open or used. And water management related local solutions alone has the potential to bring a major positive change in polar productivity. This is something very revealing that was found again and again in most of the district level you know, workshops that we attended recently for our uh, 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 mapping activity that repeatedly came again and again by actually raised by mostly by deep and you know, agriculture extension officials that this problem alone can actually make a big difference if we can solve it. And agencies active in the polar areas are responding with their own solutions independently. There are actually a lot of, you know, uh, innovative actions uh, uh, reported by uh, different agencies that they are trying to address this issue uh, either independent, independently or in association with some other critical organizations. But yet, to achieve a lot uh, in the future. And uh, considering these uh, problem, we actually uh, planned for a action research activity uh, in uh, pol two polders in coastal areas where we would like to understand the actual um, functioning and status of the water management organization that was formed principally by uh, global projects, uh, and mobilizing suggestions, opinions of the stakeholder towards the improvement of the system. We would like to actually um, follow up on what uh, exactly the local uh, people want, what the local extension or local partners want to be pursued through the system so that we can make a difference in improving the situation. So engagement at various levels, uh, we are aiming at uh, where we will pursue those recommendations from from the people uh, to see how we can improve uh, the governance through institutional improvement. And then uh, we will try to engage with all possible actors because at the moment is uh, the Water Development Board is the responsible authority, but in uh, reality, if we want to improve upon, then we need all other uh, directly, indirectly involved organizations to be on board for discussions and uh, persuasion. And uh, we would like to uh, also identify some best practices of institution, institution practices, and then uh, in two folders, we'll find some uh, opportunity to follow on so, some local initiatives in that process uh, as a piloting so that we can better understand that how uh, the, the, we, we can improve upon. And we, we have uh, we also uh, obviously has intention to take it to the national level with the help of Bangladesh Agriculture Research Council. Thank you. Uh, now it is to Indu, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Salahuddin. Uh, so we identified these key issues from our field and to dig into more you know, further details of Bangladesh, we did a very extensive literature review. 
Uh, as you can see in the diagram, we had a total of 41 documents that included published studies, plans, policies, as well as a report from some of the key institutions. Uh, so when we did this review, we did, we did look into more inclusion aspect uh, to look into environmental justice framework that says uh, the environmental resources would be fairly distributed across different groups. And across mainly, we looked into three main uh, categories, recognition, representation, and dis redistribution. So in the recognition, we focused uh, if they have equal respect or not, whether the policies and institutional mechanisms uh, include these populations, women and marginalized populations or not. And by representation, we mean to representation in decision making, uh, because in Bangladesh and uh, key uh, agency that you know that at the grassroots level is the water use water management group. So we looked into at uh, the participation of these women into re represent you know like this water management group to say whether they have equal say or not. And about the redistribution, we looked into the access to water, whether they have equal share of access to water. However, we also believe that these kind of dynamics are influenced by, you know, a lot of power dynamics across different levels. So to look into that, we also applied the political ecology concept to uh, see how different power imbalance affects, you know, like uh, the recognition, representation and redistribution of water. Space. So uh, it, it's a very detailed report. We can share the detailed finding later, but I just want to uh, give a brief highlight. So uh, as Dr. Salahuddin mentioned before, uh, the water management in Bangladesh really tried to shift to more decentralized approach in 1990s with the formulation of national water policy in 1999 and uh, following uh, guidelines for participatory water management. And the guideline uh, highlights that the executive committee membership of the water management groups, uh, you know, they should consist of 12 members and at least 30% uh, should be women. And other seats are also reserved for landless fishers and other uh, groups. So, but uh, when we really look at the literature, there are not a lot of literature. There are a few literature that, you know, looked into this representation and they highlight it. There is really, really a disconnect in policy practice landscape. Um, the women and landless, especially, they are represented very less, uh, especially like, you know, when you talk of the influ influential position, there is no any uh, study that involved, you know, that reported the involvement for women. Uh, other interesting finding is intersectionality. Even if it is women, uh, if they represent in this group, they are mostly from the rich household or elite groups, and that highlights that how you know, like the gender of women uh, intersects with other characteristics like the poor, landless, to really determine the access to water. And one of the main barriers is also uh, the structural barrier. Like uh, somehow we say that the right to water is often considered as a right to land. So those who have access to land are generally a part of the groups. And and only one people is supposed to participate that automatically because excludes women, because in most of the households, uh, women do not have land ownership. Uh, about the redistribution, we had a similar uh, report that there is unequal access to water and also the intersectionality worked a lot in redistribution and also in the representation. Next, please. OK, so um, we tried to look into barriers uh, that affected uh, these different aspects. And you can see in the slide, some of these barriers are also we found in, from our recent case studies that were done by consultants across both system, not only limited to water system. So we categorize this into two different uh, groups. The one is the power inequality. As we looked into political economy, we really looked at what are these power differences at the uh, different levels. So the gender is uh, there is as we already I, I already highlighted the physical resource ownership, uh, the ownership of land, tube oil, or other physical resources also determine access to water and representation. The political that is a very uh, significant issue because also in the field we found that the affinity to the locally elected people that actually determine uh, the use of water. For example, using the canal water for aquaculture, you know, commercial. Uh, farming, uh, you know, like that were some of the examples. The elite culture is another and economic, so based on the poverty, that's uh, played a role. Uh, if we look at the institutional uh, response, so it's it's very complicated, uh, as Dr. Salahuddin mentioned also, like um, because there are almost 
30 different agencies to look at the department or ministry or different agencies uh, that are involved in water. And if you look at the water policy, for example, it is still focused on the engineering perspective, uh, overlooking the governance and power dynamics. Uh, there are a, a lack of implementation uh, guideline because uh, we, there are so many different agencies involved. However, uh, the clear roles and responsibility is really, it's not distance in the existing guideline. Um, the other was the fragmentation that is also related to a lack of guideline and which institutions would do what, and there are uh, some trade-offs. Uh, the centralized management, I would say, because it, it is it is uh, great that the guideline for participatory water management really highlighted uh, decentralization, giving ownership and power to the local bodies. However, a lot of projects that are implemented in a project basis and the uh, involvement of local institution is uh, not there, the formal involvement. And the capacity is, uh, we found that is uh, very not any adequate in terms of financial resources, human resource, and some structural issues across different uh, sectors. And there are also a few studies that talked about lack of institutional accountability and transparency. So with these uh, different challenges in mind, what we plan to do, we really wanted to partner with the existing partner, because if you recall, uh, there, as my uh, colleague Mo presented, um, by the end of 2025, the, our EOI outcome for Work Package 4 is that policies and strategies of at least three government or development partners are informed by co-design uh, this practice. So we really are uh, developing this uh, co-transdisciplinary approach to empower and increase the participation of these different groups. Um, and as well as to strengthen the local institution uh, to meet the needs of water. So this will contribute to uh, the outcome of AMD project as well as the transboundary rivers of South Asia Trosa project uh, that is implemented by Oxfam. Uh, so we will use the same framework on the political ecology and uh, the environmental justice. So, but to uh, provide a brief overview of the Trosa project, I'd like to request my colleague Moina from Oxfam. Over to you, Moina. And Thank could you, I Andrew. request maybe that you uh, keep your presentation to about five minutes so that we have enough time for discussion? Yes. Thank, yes. You. Uh, thank you. So actually, Transboundary Rivers of South Asia started back in 2017 uh, with the aim of uh, trying to develop an inclusive and collaborative transboundary river governance system because uh, those rivers we were focusing on had no boundary actually, and it was implemented in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Myanmar. So uh, we also try to bring the CSOs, local CSOs, and uh, river relevant uh, private sectors in the same platform of community so that community voice gets more emphasis while taking a decision regarding the river governance. And to connect these different stakeholders, we engaged youth, which was found actually a very effective way, to, uh, way of report building. Uh, even when COVID hit back back in 2020. So one of the major tool was uh, for TROSA for is Nodi Boitok, or if, in English, you can see it river meeting through which we uh, we did our, the community, riparian community about their rights and access on the river and try to understand their issues and concerns. Uh, and also uh, uh, from knowing from that, we try to build their capacity to pin down those issues and how to address those solve, or at least to know the process of persuasion, inclusion or influence mainly to the government and private sectors. And we witnessed how communities, especially women and youth took initiative to reduce the conflict of common pool resources like fishing ban period, sand mining, these type of uh, sensitive issues. And through the whole process, we also learned a lot, which we will see in the next slide, actually. So for next slide, please. So you can see that the left side photo shows a bamboo structure. This is an indigenous knowledge we got to know at Brahmaputra River Basin from the riparian people. So bamboos grows there in a huge amount and the Brahmaputra, as Brahmaputra River itself is a highly erosion prone area. So people there had an innovative years ago and this vandal and took those bamboos to uh, uh, develop this structure to protect their how, house and assets from the river erosion. So this is actually uh, mean, at least one tenth of cost of the 
what government implement to uh, uh, to protect the river bank uh, like the concrete concrete made uh, infrastructures or embankments and usually uh, like uh, and there women actually took the lead to promote these uh, promote these knowledge or practice and uh, work by joining with the men also and I, we also try to look into the human cost for the conservation and human cost for any businesses, business cases. Uh, like, you, as you know, Hilsha fish is a, a rainer species throughout the South Asia, and it is a actually a geographical indicator for Bangladesh. So government of Bangladesh have a number of policies and regulations for to conserve the Hilsha. But we did not find any evidence of including the fisher folks who actually catch fishes uh, uh, in the decision making regarding those policies and practices. So, so we had a network of 60 youth who participated in a study to show the impact of fish conservation through citizen science approach. And we found like how fisher folk, fisher folks are not getting any proper safety names. Uh, social safety needs or any comp proper comp comp enough compensation during the ban periods. And as I already have said that women or women leadership uh, was built through TROSA project in the river ecosystem. And uh, we had a, we had developed a module to our, to our, the, our learning and experience in the project. And we did receive a very positive and a courageous response from the um, uh, women of community. Uh, next slide, please. So having uh, learning and the experience from the TROSA phase one, now uh, the TROSA phase two has been implemented in, in Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. And uh, now we are more in, uh, focused on the climate resilience uh, of the riparian people. So there are four outcomes which will bring the uh, bring our goal to uh, like our goal to uh, strengthen the uh, like improve cooperation in governing share water resources, strengthening resilience to climate change of the riparian communities in the transboundary uh, GBM river basin. And our focus is uh, uh, on here of women access and rights of the river resources also. So in short, this is from my side. So thank you. Thank you very much to all four presenters uh, for this very informative talk. We have now about 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, I suggest people who have questions just raise their hands and then can ask their questions. I see that there were was some activity in the chat, but I think these questions have been answered already. Um, Maybe I can make the start and uh, I have to uh, apologize for a very ignorant question. But so in the talk, for, to me as, as a, as a non-insider, it remained still very abstract uh, what, the, what the problem is and how this, um, what the ideas are to solve this. So for example, it was mentioned there's conflict within the polders. Can you give maybe examples of what is a conflict that currently exists and how that would be resolved through more uh, inclusive water governance? Shall I take this? Well, please, yes. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for small scale uh, water development projects uh, where we expect that, uh, I mean polders, so where we expect that there will be a, an embankment encircled uh, covering uh, an area and then all the major canals will have some sort of water control devices which uh, is constructed on the on the main uh, canals and then there would be a lot of uh, other smaller devices like for irrigation or for water drainage but the mostly uh, conflicts happens with the big structures 
uh, where uh, you need to decide which is the right time to open a gate for irrigation water or uh, draining water. So if this decision is made by a person which has interest in, in fishing, or if he is a you know tail ender or a head ender, then they, there will be conflicts with other people. So and if it will be it will be a complicated problem you know conflict if the decision maker is a non farmer while uh, deciding for many hundred farmer households. So the, he will only, you know, uh, be concerned about his issue perhaps is to, you know, leasing the main canal for fishing. So he will not bother about when farmers are really crying for draining the water or uh, wants to take the water from the river for uh, irrigation. So that kind of country, but it is complicated because there are many levels of, uh, you know, water management concerns. It it can be from the main canal, it can be from the secondary canals, it can be from the tertiary canals. So depending on the uh, on the crop, depending on the season, depending on the time for water, you know, demand, it will vary. OK, thanks. Yeah, that makes it a bit more uh, relatable for me. Thank you. Yeah. Katharine. Thank you uh, for giving me opportunity to ask a question. Um, uh, yes, I did. I did indeed react in the in the chat and that was on policies that were or were not included in the analysis. And because I think that there is a lot of information in there um, which may or may not be in the report. So please do share the report to me. Uh, I would really like to look at it. Um, I have a question related to uh, to to um, the the concept that you use, because on the one hand, in Asia Mega Deltas, you look from a food system perspective, and uh, in this study, I hear the term water system. And so uh, somehow you have linked the food system perspective with the water system. And there I think it's very interesting to hear a bit more from the designers of the study how they see that. Because I think in the water study and in institutions in water management, you will have a, water le a, a kind of field level, you have polder level, then you have a kind of divisional level, or, or kind of subcatchment level and national level. So at some moment, the boundaries of the water system, which are normally hydrological, are going to interfere with the boundaries of the institutional level. And that also links somehow to food systems. And um, the example of the, the TROSA uh, program, uh, I think is very interesting because they uh, are also uh, interacting at different scale levels and with different sets of stakeholders. Um, but anyway, my first question was how conceptually the food system and the water system are linked, if you have some idea about that. Okay, so can I? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very you know good question. We also had uh, this kind of dilemma, you know, like, because we were, we were exploring the challenges that are you know within the food system and looking only from food uh, production perspective. Uh, but really, as uh, my colleague Mo said, when we went to the field, we found that uh, most of the challenges, like most of the people, they highlighted water as a key issue. So uh, because we are also focusing on the smallholder farmers and there has been a lot of historical trends in Bangladesh. For example, if we look at uh, the 1990s, there is a lot of investment for stream farming. And during that phase, a lot of smallholder farmers, uh, the land were captured 
uh, for stream farming, if you look at the political perspective, and that affected these uh, people's food system, you know, like, and some of them were even laborers. Uh, so there have been the trends like these smallholders, they are largely affected and the water plays a crucial role like production and across all this value chain. Uh, if we look at the work package one, like also the work package two, like food consumption nutrition perspective. So we see there is very much a clear connection, especially to uh, look at the inclusion aspect because there has been a lot of conflicts also that has affected food system as Dr. Salautin said. Um, in terms of inclusion, for example, stream farming versus uh, rice farming or rice versus core, uh, also at the international transboundary level. So that has been the water also because of uh, Bangladesh being in that as a lowest riparian country. The problem of water has been so much you know, persistently affecting food system. So that is the reason why we highlighted. Uh, maybe my colleague uh, want to uh, uh, at that, but in the case study that we proposed, uh, there are a lot of different skills that you identified. And we, for now, uh, we uh, plan for uh, some approach that where we focus on the advocacy level at the community level, uh, starting with the advocacy, but also looking at the institutional level. Um, so further, we are still uh, finalizing uh, the, because we plan for a CS, uh, Science society approach and we will the way of uh, the study that we design is we will really identify the problems in detail and uh, co-create these solutions with the stakeholders at the ground. Uh, so for now, that is how we plan to intervene uh, in the case study. I I hope that uh, does uh, clarify the the question, Catherine. Please, is it no? It yeah. doesn't. But. Oh. Uh, well, but maybe yeah. it's beyond uh, it, maybe it's beyond the, the 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 discussion today but maybe Indu, maybe we can follow this up also outside uh, the delta talks mm -hmm. um, i understand that your focus is on the smallholder farmers uh, i recognize very much the points that you mentioned also about stream farmers etc um uh, but but still, the smallholder farmers are also included in the food system as producers, mm -hmm. as well as that they are in their own right also consumers. But in the food system, consumers from the city uh, play a much more important role. Um, uh, and and uh, um, well, I, I, I see the message of Deepa coming in, so I stop talking uh, at this moment. Uh, we can talk about it later. Yeah, okay, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's I think. Okay, so I uh, keep that uh, discussion going afterwards, please, because uh, I, I also saw that there was still a bit of uh, misunderstanding and, and uh, yeah, not well uh, aligned thinking. Uh, Sanjeev has a question. All right, thanks, Oleg. Um, I just wanted to really highlight and this is based on work that Imi did um, about seven, eight years ago in the folders, looking at water governance. And one of the things that uh, Indu mentioned just now, but I just wanted to really highlight it, is the the the, the tug of war that emerged between shrimp farming and uh, cultivators. Um, the reason I bring it up is because it has uh, implications for the entire sort of local water system, and the and the way that the folders are supposed to actually function. Um, so we 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 the point is to introduce a, a slightly sort of systems perspective here uh, in terms of placing the different actors in in this particular analysis. Um, what what was found was the um, sort of the 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 ascendance or the or the emphasis given on on shrimp farming, the 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 impacts of salinity salinity on you know cultivable land. But also the fact that the infrastructure being mismanaged meant that the the holders had no drainage. So, so I just wanted to introduce these these sort of biophysical characteristics that that seemed at that time to characterize the governance um, uh, situation there. And just wondered whether some of the uh, presenters wanted to reflect on that or respond. Thank you. Sorry, reflect on what in particular? Can you point that out again? The, the, the relationship between the drivers of the 
the, the waterscape there uh, in, in relation to the um, food production systems and the actors? How does that how does that fit or, or what are the implications of you know, the, 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 the mismanagement of the entire polar system uh -huh. um, for different for different food uh, producers? OK, so what's yeah, what's the kind of the challenge? The, what's what impact has the current mismanagement on food pro producers? I think yeah. I can try to answer this uh, because I was attending uh, the ongoing CS map workshops in six districts. So it appeared uh, again and again uh, as an adaptation approach from this problem of water management that if we can, you know, uh, operate all those structures well and we if we can ensure that all the canals uh, and uh, secondary tertiary also uh, if they are re-excavated well if the drainage and irrigation is controlled uh, in a in a nicer way then uh, most of the problem of uh, irrigation and drainage will be solved so that we don't really need any big intervention of new technologies or you know adjustment to the uh, uh, cropping system but with only single interventions of good water management we can solve perhaps 50% of the problems that is what uh, most of the DAE officials have uh, you know shared with us in most most of the workshops. So that can okay. actually make a big difference. Thank you. I think uh, Katharine has some uh, intervention. I saw something in the chat going on, but maybe we can bring that to the attention of everyone. Uh, OK, well, I, I uh, there was a, uh, a message to uh, give other people also opportunity to ask questions. So but what I reacted was to um, uh, is about the, uh, the the management. If we call management mismanagement, then it's because we have an opinion on what is good management. And I think it's good to be explicit about that. And I think that good management is different for different groups of users. Um, I, 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 I think that's uh, that's a good point kind of to to get more into detail about. I think the other remark of Deepa is an important one that um, uh, and I, I think maybe Deepa you come in and you kind of uh, say something about that. We um, of, of the first one or the second one, uh, maybe I'll start with the second so that the you know, what we find is that implementing stakeholders at at various levels, Catherine, that you pointed out, don't, don't have the capacity or incentive and the, the institutions don't have the finances and the resources to capacitate them or to provide them more incentive for more equitable water sharing and access. And this seems like a very real challenge, which is also evolving in different ways, like the lack of uh, transfer, translation of research and policy to extension is one angle of it as well. So, you know, I think it's really important to pay attention to these issues and, and how, how can we do it? And, you know, just technically bringing these stakeholders into workshops, you know, which so many people have been doing is not really changing anything. Yeah, um, no, I, I think so that's a good good thing to point out. And in that sense, it, it is remarkable that in, uh, for instance, the policies, um, uh, a lot of the policies in the past would be limited to a specific ministry. So this policy was done by this ministry and then the other ministries were, well, maybe involved in lip service, but not really in implementation. And the question is whether in more recent policies that has changed and also in the sense that what you say that the the implementing stakeholders um, uh, to, to have them involved 
uh, in water sharing and in access to water, are there examples of where that happened and then what was that made it happen? And if it does not happen, um, I, I, I do think we need mm -hmm. to think about what governance structures could be to, to make it happen. Uh, and it's indeed very interesting to see the example of Trossa, what they have done. I also think the example of uh, uh, IUCN um, was very interesting a number of years ago on the Hilsha fish, uh, the research in the transboundary uh, area. But um, I, I, I think in the, this particular case, what is very remarkable is that for uh, a, a long time, also CGIR was very much separating the agriculture research from the water research. And that's the very interesting thing of this Asia Mega Delta is that you have both sides uh, at the table. And um, how can we then look at uh, the things so that we can make it connected to each other? So that's uh, what I'm kind of looking after. But I see other hands also. Me too. I saw Feroz having his hand up. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, Catherine already mentioned it. I was going to say like, OK, for example, of cooperation to work. I know in Polder 22, people actually manage uh, their water systems so that the uh, Silent water couldn't get in and they could do agriculture. So that was kind of successful. So there are examples, but like uh, as in the presentations, the presenter said, like the structures are maintained by BWDB. They're more uh, focused on water, but the users are like uh, either agriculture or fishermen. Then there is no an integrated structure to maintain an operation of these structures of the folders where the end users can influence how these structures are maintained. And uh, it's not only like the shrimp cultures or rice cultures. In some areas, the rice cultures, the field is used for multiple purposes as well. So in one season they do rice culture, in the next they might do fish culture there as well. And I've seen that when I was in the field as well. So I think, uh, yeah, indeed, a uh, integrated approach is needed where like the end users can influence the structural operations of these builders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to respond on this issue? Or I'll raise a different question also possible. We Maybe have a I few can minutes just... left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, what was interesting in some of the districts that to see that there are agencies such as uh, Bangladesh Agriculture Development uh, or uh, BADC uh, Corporation. They are now coming as a very significant agency who are trying to, you know, re excavate canals inside polders or trying to solve some of the drainage problems, which has been actually appreciated by all other actors like DAE especially. And in some polders, we have also seen uh, DAE people are talking about, uh, you know, the interventions, very positive interventions from the administration. For instance, the deputy commissioner of a district. If, uh, because they, they are the authority who actually take the, uh, give the lease out to the Fisher community. So in th those people are very powerful in the system. If they together can uh, come up with good recommendations that how uh, we can make all these uh, existing rules and regulations into something effective. So in maybe we will, uh, you know, hear in as recommendations in our workshop that we need as the existing uh, the uh, legal uh, tools that we have in our hand uh, into something different, which will actually be more conducive in the future. So actually, we are expecting real life uh, recommendations from uh, as bottom as possible, uh, like the farmer groups or polder 
water management groups or to the Upozilla interaction, sorry, at the district level. So we're expecting all those good advices, recommendations can then be transformed into uh, some uh, policy recommendations which can help us ultimately to make some mm. uh, reformation. And who is supposed to provide these uh, recommendations? Uh, these recommendations we are expecting from in the polder level, we would like to include the water management organizations, farmers and local extension officers uh, uh, in the FGD process. They will uh, have set up recommendations. Then we can interact at the Upuzila level where all the government actors can come together and uh, look at the recommendations coming from the grassroots and and so as to the other levels uh, at the district and, and national level. Mm. OK, so I think uh, the challenge will be how to translate all these recommendations in something actionable yes. and potentially also something that can be uh, applied on a wider scale than one folder where they might may be coming from. I have to say, we, uh, I'm sorry that we have to uh, leave this discussion here. Uh, so there was uh, there were some open points that Katarine wanted to bring up uh, after this meeting. Please do so. Send an email. Um, I would say for the next uh, webinar, let's try to limit really the presentation to 20 minutes if possible, so that we have really sufficient time for in-depth discussion. Because you know we always say we take a discussion up later and then it gets uh, somehow lost. So it would be good to really make most use of this hour that we will have in four weeks from now. Uh, I just checked my calendar. I will not be able to participate uh, because I will be at the World Water Week. Um, maybe I'll see some of you there. Um, I would then hand it to uh, Katharine to uh, nominate or find a presenter from Wageningen uh, for the webinar in four weeks. Communicate with Mel and Eisen on that, and uh, and I hope we have uh, a discussion as good as we had today. Yes, I uh, just uh, to interrupt you quickly because we have one minute left. Uh, thank you very much. I will find a, an, an other speaker, uh, most likely on our case study in Vietnam. Uh, so that will be interesting. Uh, and also, I just like to mention that uh, we, uh, some of my colleagues uh, were in Rome for the food uh, summit stop taking moment and have been saying water there as well, because in a lot of the food system plans of the different countries, water is not mentioned. So we are pushing for that. Um, and yes, I will follow up uh, with uh, the presenters of today and Deepa, who also men mentioned very important points in the chat. Um, so uh, yes, we will follow up. So thank you all very much for organizing this and looking forward to meet you again. And thanks again to the presenters for this elaborate presentations. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you also from my side and see you very soon. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.